love lifted me. My old five. Welcome to church. I'm so glad you're here. We're going to continue with our study on the book of Romans, okay? And uh, 
I keep, uh, I, I, I uh, kind of chuckled the other day, I saw an interest, it doesn't have to do with my sermon, but I had a funny cartoon I saw, it. Lucy and Charlie Brown were laying under a tree, and Lucy said, Charlie Brown, does every fairy tale end in, and everyone lived happily ever after? And he said, no, Lucy, some end in, on my first day in office, I planned on doing. <laughs> so, you know, there we go. <laughs> And so here we go. I want to talk to you about the six principles of God's judgment on sinful men. And we looked at uh, four of them so far. And one of them is knowledge. And what we said with the knowledge thing is you can't hide your true self from God. You can't buffalo God. Uh, it's based on that point then. We also said you shouldn't puff yourself up as the ultimate judge of others. Uh, God judges us and all of us need forgiveness from God. So we, we, we need to have a, a degree of humility is called for in the Christian faith. Number two is truth. And God is perfect truth. Uh, man never knows the whole truth. And that's why our standard is Jesus' truth and not ours. You know, sometimes I bet you there's times where you say, God, it just, you're just not making sense to me today. But that's where faith comes in. And you've got to trust that God is the ultimate truth in this world. world. And He is the way, the truth, and the life. Guilt. God judges us based on our guilt. Guilt can be good if it leads you to Christ and forgiveness. You know, sometimes I have to, I, God hits me with a guilt bomb, and I hate that. You know, I mean, I had a terrible attitude, you know, at the uh, car dealership the, uh, last this week. And it was, I went, they go, come and pick up your car. And I went down there, and, and uh, they said, well, we're going to be getting to it. I said, you said come pick it up two hours later? I was really mad, and I uh, told them about it. I said, well, I'm glad nobody knew I was a pastor there. So, you know, <laughs> I did get $150 off my bill, though. So, hey, you know, but, uh, oh, what can I say? <laughs> uh, Yoke is good if it leads us to, for, uh, to Christ and His forgiveness. God, God is patient, and he, but His patience does have limits. Um, Jesus wants to forgive us, but again, Jesus isn't all right with sin. He wants us to repent from that. The purpose of the patience of Jesus is that we would all come to salvation and repentance. And so that's, that's what God's patience is, is, is waiting for. Um, in deeds, and you know, a lot of times, you know, we have, there's people in the Bible that think, well, God forgives me for everything, so what does it matter what I do? And, and, and we, we say what you do does matter. And, what, and, and it doesn't save us but it's evidence of God's presence in our hearts. You know, if somebody tells me I'm saved and they, they live like the devil, I have reason to, to, to think that he wasn't sincere with God. And so I would approach it like that. That um, Blessings come on those who live by God's word and trouble to those who don't. Um, and then today we get to our, our text, and that's going to be God's impartiality when it comes to his judgment. And that's verses 11 through 15. And then next week, if you come back, we're going to talk about how God judges our motives. Okay? Oh, I meant well. Now, God knows if you really did. Okay? So uh, we're going to talk about that. But Jacob, you're up. we got uh, Romans 2, 11 through 15. We're going to study through. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 11. And it reads... For there is no partiality with God, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness in their thoughts, alternately accusing or else defending them. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for your word. God, I pray that you help us to God, rightly divided with your Holy Spirit and, and guiding us. And God, help us to, uh, you know, 
be convicted where we need conviction, encourage where we need encouragement. And God, the prayer today is that every as at every Sunday that we walk out here better equipped to serve you. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so we're looking at impartiality. It says there in our text that there is no partiality with God. And so what does that word mean, partiality? Well, in its original, it really means to receive a face. To receive a face. Now, what does that mean? Well, that is to give special consideration to a person because of who he is. You know, if a person walks in, you know, we, we in, in America tend to glorify you know, celebrities and, and politicians and all. What if Taylor Swift came in there? Oh, Taylor, you can sit right up front, do whatever you, you know, and we tend to, we tend to di just get a, kind of giddy over people that are, are, are famous. But God doesn't do that. He, he, he treats us all the same. And the idea of impartiality is symbolic of that well-known statue in the justice courts. Uh, you have a, probably seen it, a woman that with her eyes blindfolded signifying that she's unable to see who's before her and to be judged and therefore for not tempted to be partial either for or against the accused based on who they are. There's all, you know, I didn't know this until I studied this. Sometimes that statue of justice is shown with the hands tied behind it and that means they're unable to accept bribes too as, a, as part of the thing. Uh, so, uh, in the impartiality of God versus man, well, unfortunately, man is not totally impartial. You know, I mean, it, we like to believe we are, and we aspire to be, but, you know, you can see that just more and more in our world. I, I hear a lot of people, and rightly so, you're praying for America, because there's a lot of partiality going on in politics. You know, a lot of times we'll, we'll give less credence to a person uh, what, and what they say based on their what party they belong to, or what about the uh, candidates? But, but but what about the candidates' beliefs about issues? Shouldn't that govern uh, your vote solely, <clears throat> whether they're Republican or Democrat? Race race is often cited as a place where people don't have uh, impartial judgment. Um, do people judge you solely on the basis of the color of their sin? I think Martin Luther King Jr was uh, very, uh, said it very well when he said he, he longed for the day that we would not be judged by the color of their sin, but by the content of their character. And I believe that's a biblical position of judgment, that we should not look at that say, things. And then, you know, sometimes, it, it, we're, now we're dealing with and wrestling with this whole idea of DEI, and we have to ask ourselves, is that what God would want in our, in our world? Uh, sexuality, do we put more weight on a person based on their sexuality? Are men and women are the, of the same value of God and to God? Uh, we, are to, we are told there is no difference to God whether you are a man or a woman. In Galatians 3, 27 through 29, it says, For all of you were baptized into Christ clothed, and, and have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, and there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. And so, unfortunately, man is never totally impartial, but Jesus is. Why? Well, I've already given you a bunch of reasons why Jesus is impartial and man isn't. Number one is... Uh, uh, number one is knowledge. We already talked about that. When you deal with human testimony, there is always a question as to what that was really said. Could they have misinterpreted what they heard or saw a, a, at the time? I was on a jury not long ago, and it was a, it was a uh, attempted murder thing. And people came in and gave you know conflicting testimonies. And then you got you're trying to sift through this and figure out what is the truth. The great thing with God is He knows. You, you don't really need to tell. He knows already. He knows the truth, and, he, and, and so He's impartial to that. You know, He, he shows great impartiality. And not, other things, God's knowledge is so complete. Nothing is hidden from Him. Nothing is misinterpreted. Have you ever had said something and somebody took it wrong? Oh, I'm a king of that. You know, I said, you know, and I didn't really... But God doesn't misinterpret anything. He knows exactly what you're saying and what you meant by it. And that's, that's beautiful. Beautiful. 
uh, God's righteousness exists. There's no in misappropriation of law. No using it in an inappropriate way. Sometimes I think we see law being twisted and bent and used in different ways for different people today. That doesn't happen with God. It doesn't matter if you're a king or you're a pauper. The law is the law. And then you're held accountable to it. Judge, his judgment is always right and appropriate. Position, education, influence, popularity, physical appearance will have absolutely no bearing on God's decisions concerning your personal, uh, your eternal destiny. Examples of God's uh, impartial judgment is one, I bet, is a weird one, I bet. You consider Lucifer, the Satan. You know, if you knew the history of Satan, he was once an angel. And not only was he an angel, he was the most exalted, magnificent of all God's creation. Lucifer was known as the star of the morning and the sun of the dawn. And despite all God had given him, he sought to be greater than God. And as a result, God cast him out of heaven. And even his most magnificent creation received justice for his rebellion. He was judged like anybody else would have tried to raise himself above. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 give you the story. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You have been weak. You have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend upon above the heights of the clouds. And I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, where that's his hell, and to the recesses of the pit. There, if there was ever a person that deserved some special consideration from God, you'd think it'd be Lucifer. He was his grandest of angels. But he broke God's law, and he received God's judgment. Yet, you know, because of all that, that, that was given to him, he was cast out for his rebellion to the Sheol hell. And Satan, as we're told, will occupy the worst part of hell. Peter is an example of somebody that struggled with prejudice. He, he didn't like Gentiles. Okay? And, 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 and he overcame it by the God's grace. And I, I know we can overcome any prejudice by God's grace. Peter wrote, it wrote in Acts 10, 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. You know, God isn't one to show partiality. Paul falsely faced people who were high, of high social status. And his response to them was this in Galatians 2 6. He says, But for those of you who were of, who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. You know, sometimes if you run around, you know, a football coach with a kiss kissing their tail, just, you know, being nice to people of, are, are important. At the end of the day, you have to look back and say, what did all that special treatment do for me? You know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, I used to love you know, certain football players. I hung them up on the wall, but they didn't know me when I walked down the street, you know. Uh, you know, I, they were there to help me. God was there to help me. And, 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 and so I think sometimes this, this hero worship that we have can is a dangerous thing. God says, have no idols. And we make people idols sometimes. We, in fact, we have a whole show, right? American Idol, you know. We all do aspire to be there. Did my battery die? Yeah. Okay, well that's okay. I'll just go. Okay. In summary, <laughs> we live in a society that weighs the options of the world with um, with much more face. He's amazing. <laughs> I tried to fix my fence today, and, and I got so, so so frustrated, I had to go in and leave it broke. And he, he fixes some in five minutes. Okay. Anyways, uh, it's, 
we live in a society that weighs the opinions of the world much more than it weighs the opinions of God. I believe that. And you see, what our society sees as permissible or moral, abortion on demand, gender-affirming sur surgeries on our youth without the parents' notification, lack of persecution of criminal behavior, lack of support for Israel, all, the, uh, all these things. We don't judge righteously. We judge on standards that are lowered if enough people don't follow them. If enough people have an, have an abortion, we say it's legal, therefore it's moral. If enough people say want gay lifestyles taught, taught in our school, we, want, we legalize that, and what the Bible says is not considered relevant. We are rude to each other, and that re is reflected in our political rhetoric. We can't seem to stick to the issues, and we continue to attack each other's candidates' character as opposed to their positions on issues that should matter to us. There is one person who, should, who we should consider when we determine how we should live, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He should set our, our, our tone. Hey, how, how does this line up with God's word, these policies? And that should, that should be your big question as you decide who you're going to vote for and what you do. Jesus, it matters uh, to you when it comes, if it matters to you, when it comes to moral issues, the color of one's sin, the political party they're affiliated, their age, whether they're male or female, I'm here to tell you it doesn't matter to Jesus. No one will be excluded from heaven based on color of their skin or their political parties they're affiliated. No one will be blessed based on uh, how much, uh, how old they are or whether they are male or female. The one of the best pictures, I think, of God's impartiality is found in the story of Lazarus and the rich young ruler. In Luke 19, 16, you see that. There was a rich man, and he was habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And there was a poor man, his name was Lazarus, and he was laid at the gate covered in sores and longing to be freed, uh, fed the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Uh, <clears throat> Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. The poor man died, was carried in by the angels to Abraham's bosom, which is a thing that, that means heaven to the, to the Jews. And the rich man also died. He was buried in Hades. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham far away, uh, way, and Lazarus in his bosom. Uh, and he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that I may dip, so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that when during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted, and you are being in, you are in agony. And besides, all this between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over to you to, uh, to you will not be able and that and none may cross over to, uh, from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send my send to my father's house um, <clears throat> for my, I have five brothers and in order that they may, uh, may warn them, and that they may not also come to this place of torment. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, no, Father, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if somebody is raised from the dead. And I think that's true. I you know. I've seen people beg God for mercy and healing and things like that, and they'll receive it, and then they'll go away and they'll just drop off, and they don't accept God, God's, God's provision, and don't don't accept Christ. You know, I I have a friend that 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 uh, had a son that fell off the deep end, and 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 and, and he got involved with Teen Challenge, and he got saved, and he got in, in all that, and all the things were going good, but. But he never came, he never would go back to church. He never would do, do anything. And it broke my heart that he would, you know, he would receive such a blessing and then reject God. And by the way, God knows who's going to reject him and who isn't. 
You know, the guy says, well, if you save, send somebody from that raised from the dead, he'll listen to him. He said, no, he won't. He, I know this guy. He won't even believe that somebody was raised from the dead. He will reject him. God does not judge you by what you have or what you, you don't have. You know, if you see this story I just read you about Lazarus, um, but what about the widow? She came to church and threw a couple pennies in the thing, and there were people standing around that criticized her for how little she gave. And yet, in God's economy and in his judgment, he, his response to those critics were that she had given more than all because she gave out of her poverty and not out, out of her wealth. And God put more value in those couple pennies than he did all the, all the shekels that all these rich guys threw in there. God judges us by the heart, and God knows our heart. And it's my prayer that as we go through this, the, the, these days, and these, these trying days, that we seek God. Thank God that you guys ask that God would pray, that, that you ask for discernment as we go through our political process. Thank God that, that God knows us intimately. Because that means, you know, who can I share this with, this terrible thing that I've done or this terrible thing I, that, that has happened to me? You can share it with God. Because, by the way, He already knows. And He died for those things. And He, and he, was, he, he's, he said, come to me, all you that are weary and heavy and wet laden. I will give you rest. God knows, so why keep it a secret? You know, I can put a good face on for you, but if I chewed the guy out at the Chevy dealership, God knows, and maybe I better say I'm sorry, you know? So those are the things we do. <laughs> Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, God, I just pray, if anybody here that's never given their life to Christ, God, you know them. Maybe you're tugging on their hearts today. God, let them pray and receive you. You said, Behold, I'd stand at the door and knock. If anybody answers the door, I will come in to them. Just let them pray. Lord, I know, I, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my life. God, forgive me for my sin. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. And then, God, for those of us who know you, Lord, oh, God, let us be impartial to all people. Let us love the people you've called us to love, the people you bring into our lives. And let us be shining examples of your love in us. In Christ's name, amen.